Oh, look at me. Yeah. Water, oil, smoke. How we define ourselves, it's through our art, the style of our beadwork, the baskets we make. Here we go. Whoops. Here we go. Who are you? I'm on the edge of the northwestern Minnesotan plains where the prairie and sky come together at an infinitely far place. It's the middle of the day, but the sky is dark like night. I'm walking my bike up a loose gravel hill, and its peak grows further and further away. To the east, a red-tailed hawk is carelessly tossed with a gust of wind. To the west, a bald eagle pulls its head out of a carcass to look at me. I'm walking forward, but moving backwards, Something brushes the back of my neck, so I swing my head around and see a fairy dart into a patch of sumac. I finally reach the top of the hill and know for certain that I've made it to the reservation. My great-great-grandma left here, the White Earth Reservation, in 1915, and our family has never returned. I'm turning 30 and am biking back. I've rarely visited because as a child I was told that one, there's nothing to see, and two, it's dangerous. On paper, the poverty rate is near 50%, and a quarter of the population is unemployed. Monoman County, which includes the White Earth Reservation, has the lowest per capita income in the entire state. Amidst the statistical poverty, attacks on Ojibwe culture, and a century of land theft, I found that the opposite of our old family narrative is true. White Earth is rich in natural beauty, and the people carry a truth that they will share if you listen. Get you all day, nah? The city. Everything I need for sleeping and eating will be carried on my bike. I'll burn 40 calories per mile, 480 per hour. So on the long days, I'll have to eat over 4,000 calories without upsetting my stomach. I've never biked 100 miles in a day, let alone back to back to back. And each night, I'll be stealth camping in undetermined locations. All of these concerns seem insignificant, however, when considering the trip my great-great-grandma took 105 years ago. Anne-Marie Fairbanks lived from 1893 to 1998. I knew her as the very old grandma. She was born on the White Earth Reservation 26 years after its legal establishment. Her father, B.L. Fairbanks, owned a general store and likely operated in two worlds switching between English and Ojibwe language and customs, depending on the situation. All of his children, except Anne-Marie, attended local schools. Anne-Marie was sent to the Benedictine Mission School. Actually, her major was music. This is my grandma. Her grandma is Grandma Anne-Marie. I said, what did you major in? I majored in piano. And I said, piano. And I said, why would you do that? Honey girl. She, you were always honey girl or honey boy. Honey girl. She said, I was going to marry well and play the piano all day. <laughs> I said, well, that didn't happen. <laughs> you know, I, I hear different things about it. Margaret Rousseau is an enrolled member of White Earth and general manager of Niji Radio. Her great grandma, like Grandma Anne Marie, also attended the mission school. Different people had different perspectives. I don't know, um, at that time, the shamefulness that was associated with being an Indian person. Uh, and right. do you know what I'm saying? So if you were ashamed to be Indian, you're going to be happy to be in that school because guess what? It's removing the Indian from you. I talked to another lady. She was a Bakanaga down in the cities. And her experience at boarding school was good, but then she also said, because um, we needed to learn how to be 
white. My great-great-grandma also enjoyed the mission school. She already knew how to do bead work, but there, the nuns taught her how to sew European clothing. She was good and quickly became a professional seamstress. Mission school was okay for Grandma Anne Marie, but this wasn't the case for everyone, and for Ojibwe culture as a whole, it was a tragedy. By the time the very old grandma turned 20, she had two children and decided she needed to leave White Earth. Her two-year-old daughter stayed with her mother, and her four-year-old son with her brother. You know, why did she leave the reservation and come to the city? I think she had to work. She and her husband, my mother's father, uh, had separated, and she had two children, and she needed to find money. In 1915, the single mother of two, Anne Marie, traveled by horse-drawn buggy to the Monoman Rail Station. She rode to Detroit Lakes, where she transferred to the southbound Northern Pacific Line. The train passed east through St. Cloud and south to St. Paul, where my great-great-grandma first stepped foot in the city. In this same city, I step out of my apartment with a loaded bike, hop on, and begin pedaling north. Siebe. The river. The first leg of the bike ride is along the Mississippi River Trail, past the ruins of Mills, Boom Island, and a railroad bridge that Grandma Anne Marie could have crossed 105 years ago. At Boom Island, she would have seen men sorting floating timber and loosening log jams with dynamite. The mills would have been grinding wheat into flour, and the streets packed with trolleys, horses, and people, many groups of them. In Minneapolis, she would have seen Scandinavian Protestants. In northeast Minneapolis, pockets of Czech and Polish. In north Minneapolis, Jewish. When she crossed into St. Paul, she would have passed through the Rondo neighborhood, primarily African-American, Swede Hollow, primarily Swedish, and downtown St. Paul, run by the Irish Catholics. Where did Grandma Anne Marie, an Anishinaabe Kwe Catholic, find her community? My grandma was over 95 years old, and every day she walked from her place, which is right across from Regent's Hospital, and down to Mass at St. Mary's. I think the, um, the Catholic faith, the Christian faith, and Native American spirituality are very compatible. Father Joe Hidpass leads three parishes on the reservation. One of them is St. Benedict's, where B.L. Fairbanks, Anne Marie's father, belonged. Anne Marie was Catholic but I can't help but wonder if any of her native Medewan spirituality were sprinkled into her spiritual understanding. You know, whether you use incense or you use smudging, you know, they're very similar, but uh, have some of the same meanings. My own feeling would be that there is no native religion as such, as you would have a Jewish religion or a Catholic religion or uh, whatever you want to call it but that there is a spirituality there, and that spirituality is very valid and very, very good and fits very nicely with Christian religion. I don't know Grandma Anne Marie's spiritual outlook. I was eight years old when she died. But there are several elders who, like Anne Marie, attended mission school and are now members of this parish. Father Joe is sensitive to a hesitancy among them. Actually, there's only one or two people that I'm aware of that uh, object to the um, drums in church, and I'm not entirely sure why that is true. Uh, As I mentioned in one of the parishes I was in earlier, um, they were, um, the natives, at least the older natives, were very much against any of the native stuff because they felt from their training that those were not compatible with with Christianity, but um, I don't think that's the general um, uh, idea today, the general acceptance today. Um, and so from my point of view, you know, drums here are, are not a problem at all. At mile 75, I depart from the Mississippi River Trail and head west along St. Cloud's Division Street. It's rush hour, my left knee is beginning to throb, and the bike path is just a rarely used sidewalk. Three lanes of traffic race between strip malls to the next stoplight, 
slowing down only to refuel their tanks with gas or their guts with grease. A mother and daughter dancing on the sidewalk break up the monotony. They hold a sign that reads love each other and drivers smile and beep. I keep pedaling and remember that my paternal grandfather lived on this road before the highway came through. His home, the corner store, and his neighbor's melon patch have all been paved over. In a journal, he wrote about his birthplace. The population was mostly Finlanders, so with an Irish mother and Norwegian father, I was almost an outsider. After seven miles on the sidewalk, the distance between strip malls grows, so I know that I'm getting closer to my unofficial campsite at St. John's University, my alma mater. Today, the flavor of St. John's Catholicism is quite different from the Indian mission schools they once sponsored. Religion is available for exploration, but not forced upon anyone. For me, the Catholic ritual complemented the mysticism of the land, swimming in an ice-cold lake that reflects the fall colors, falling asleep against a hundred-year-old oak tree and waking up surrounded by turkeys and having a snowball fight as flakes the size of cherries fall from the sky. I came to love the mystical Catholicism of Thomas Merton, the altruistic Catholicism of Dorothy Day, and the spiritual sight nature offers. But I'm sad for the pain the religion has caused, so I hold all of these feelings together. Well, well the whole idea of a sacrament, a sacrament is a visible sign of God's presence, and, and so... Uh, Water, oil, uh, smoke, all of those things very quickly become symbols that can be uh, part of life, part of uh, scripture is trying to tell us and uh, also to uh, connect with uh, everyday life and what people are doing. Mile 89, I dismount and walk my bike into the forest, hang my hammock and change into fresh clothes. The abbey bells ring and it's a new moon. The forest is completely black. And for a moment, I'm scared. But I lay down, make friends with the forest, and try to be less of an outsider. The Savannah. My alarm goes off and dawn is just breaking through the canopy. I'm sleeping in a Midwestern oak savanna, and on my ride today, I'll be passing through many more. This ecosystem is created by fire that for thousands of years was ignited by lightning and my ancestors. I'll be riding through land that for hunting or traveling purposes, Indians didn't want to become dense forest. The fire resistant oaks survive and the underbrush is destroyed giving way to a lightly forested grassland. This is a transition zone between the broadleaf forests and the arid Great Plains. My grandmother, I, I think because of need, learned to sew. By securing employment as a seamstress, great-grandma Anne Marie was able to navigate the city and find a job in St. Paul. Then my mother came down when she was about three or four. Okay. My, my grandma sent for her. Okay. And... Um, she was, you know, she came to the cities. I wonder if Anne Marie explained their new world in English or Ojibwe, how that this apartment was their new home. Yeah, I'm Joe Allen, and I'm the coordinator of the Gijigan Arts Incubator here in Manoman, Minnesota. The Gijigan Arts Incubator is a hub for entrepreneurial and artistic resources at White Earth. If you look at how we define ourselves, it's through our art, you know, it's through our, the, the, the style of our beadwork and the style of our clothing and the baskets we make. Anne Marie was a skilled seamstress, so talented that she sewed costumes for the Minneapolis Aquantennial. Most indigenous languages do not have a word for art. Whether sewing for work, pleasure, or necessity, my grandma remembers always seeing Anne Marie's room filled with costumes. For a little girl, it was just a fairyland to be able to go, go into her bedroom where she was sewing and try on all these costumes and watch her. Um, then the models would come over 
and they would try them on. And I thought, oh, this is wonderful. This is what I wanted to. Sewing throughout the night, it was Anne Marie's vocation. She was clearly an artist, but like Joe said, would likely have never called herself one. Gyagushimawin, that means fasting. Merlin Deegan oversees the cultural division for White Earth, where he facilitates tribal events like fasting camps. Why he went and sat out in the woods was to become grounded, is to become grounded with yourself and the universe and not to be afraid. You have to take time for yourself to do what it is so that you can become a good person. At mile 59 of today's 110, I've passed the town of Alexandria and I'm getting close to Fergus Falls. Biking for 10 hours a day has given me a chance to observe my mind. While my physical self travels in a straight line, my mind wanders in circles, loops, and figure eights. When I focus, I think about turning 30 and how I've spent my life up until this point. There aren't any revelations, just a review of what has and hasn't worked so far. You don't know how much is out there that's pulling at your spirit. You guys have no idea, no idea how much is pulling at your guys' spirit as young men, as young women. I stop at an old stairway that leads down to the eastern shore of a lake. The sun is low and warm despite the wind slicing sheets of water at the beach. It's the golden hour and the lake gleams with a surreal aura. I splash the grit off my face and let the cold water relieve my knees and hips. With an impulsive rush, I dive all the way in and come up gasping for air. The wind slaps waves against my cheek and I've never been more awake in my entire life. I swim to shore, dry off, shivering in the sun, and keep pedaling. The Reservation The patch of woods that I had planned on camping in turned out to be dense scrub brush, unsuitable for a hammock. There were some larger trees and dirt speedway across the street, so I set up camp there. After a spotty night of sleep, because the absurdly loud races went until 2 a.m., I broke camp and continued north. My knee, which I had hoped would miraculously mend itself overnight, was not in good shape. I named it Ricket and quickly realized that Ricket was here to stay. The first half of today's 84 miles wound along back roads, between lakes and over rolling hills. The land seemed as if it didn't know what it wanted to be, prairie or forest, flat or hilly, lake or land. One specific stand of oak and pine stood above the rest, like a medieval castle the oak fortress was surrounded by a moat-like wetland, daring invaders to enter. I declined the challenge and continued pedaling to the day's halfway point, Lake Park, Minnesota. It was 1 p.m. and the only store in town, Jeff's Food Center, was about to close. I bought more water, an apple, and a chocolate bar. Jeff insisted he buy the apple for me since I biked. I told him I only had 30 miles to go, and he said all the bad things happen in the final stretch. Thanks, Jeff. In one way or another, the very old grandma was able to rear her children in the city. Her daughter, Audrey Gravel, eventually married my great-grandpa, the Irishman George Martin. They had two children, my grandma Marilyn, and her late brother, Jimmy. Marilyn and Jimmy grew up as city kids, walking the streets, riding the trolleys, and racing their cars. No one returned to White Earth. What, what brought you back? The people. Maggie again from Niji Radio. You know, you have that connection with the people that you have known all your life, um, a connection to the, you know, like to the earth here. You know, when you think about historically, 
survival was all off the land. Our people moved from spot to spot at harvest times. They knew where there were a lot of berries. They would be by the woods and they'd be doing lots of berries. When it was time to fish, they'd be beside the streams, spearing the fish, um, wild rice out to the lakes. I was on my final 30 mile stretch, biking along a loose gravel road that is the western border of the White Earth Reservation. There's no visible difference between the land on my left and that on my right. Plots on both sides are checkered with farms and wetlands. To my right, a flock of trumpeter swans rest in the muddy basin of a farm field. The high sun is creating a mirage effect, and I can't understand how they keep their white feathers so clean. At any other moment, I would have seen the sky, the land, this border road, and the swans as a metaphor. But I was dusty, tired, and delusional. There were no cars, trees, or tractors, just the six feet of gravel in front of me. A gust of wind whipped from the south, and I wasn't there at all. I was watching a man in a white shirt pedal a yellow bike. I'm wondering what you think about me. It's like, I'm sure there's a lot of people like me that... There's a ton of people. ...sort of have, like, my great-great-grandma was raised here. So here's, here's my thought. People like you need to learn who you are as a Ojibwe man. And once you learn who you are as an Ojibwe man and learn those values and decide that that's your identity, then you get enrolled. Someone sat and told me once uh, that they were white. I said, what does it mean to be white? Because they were talking to me about, oh, you're Indian, you're Native American, what, what's, it, what's it like? And I said, well, what are you? Well, I'm white. So what does it mean to be white? I threw, threw that back at them, and they didn't have an answer. When my grandma Marilyn was young, her mother, Audrey, used to tell her, Honey girl, you don't need to tell anyone that you're Indian. You're white enough. In fact, my dad told me that when he first saw my mother and started dating her, my mother clearly told him, You know, I'm Indian. Even when Grandpa and I got married, when Ron's mother, your, what would she be, your great-grandmother, when she found out I had Indian in me, she just hit the ceiling. I mean, look at me, though. I have okay. blue eyes, both hair. <laughs> look at me. <laughs> Maggie takes off her glasses. She has blue eyes. Yeah. Look at me. Maggie grabs a strand of her dirty blonde hair. <laughs> but how do you know you're Ojibwe? Not just my great-great-grandma was Ojibwe, or, oh, my mom's Ojibwe, you know? What does it mean? Who are you? My great-great-grandma Anne-Marie Fairbanks died when I was eight. For the years I knew her, she was silent, and in her company, I was too, because I never knew what to say. I remember giving her a drawing once. She was sitting in her wheelchair in the nursing home, and my dad was doing all of the talking. I extended my drawing towards her, and her thumb and forefinger slowly closed around it. Her centenarian hands were skeletal yet strong, dark yet translucent. I looked at her eyes and she was looking back at me. As always, neither of us spoke. This is part of you. You would visit her. You knew who she was. You saw her. And I think, Steve, it's part of my heritage. It's part of watching my mother, watching all of the, the trials and tribulations of being Indian. It's part of me. It's part of who I am. The tailwind that whipped from the south turned out to be more than just a gust. It persisted and saved me. The gravel road turned to pavement and I was flying. Fully loaded bike, mile 280 of 283, cruising at 18 miles per hour. 
Even Rickett, my knee, was nimble and strong. I made it to the economic center of the reservation, the Shooting Star Casino, took a shower in a smoky motel room, and turned on the TV. Over the last 150 years, fragments of my lineage, both native and European, have followed the Mississippi River south to the city that I now inhabit, St. Paul, Minnesota. This place, this world, has changed, yet a thread remains connecting the past to the present. It's in the old city streets, the pitch-black forests, and the prairie grasslands. It's in the people, like my grandma, Maggie, Father Joe, Merlin, and Joe Allen. And in fleeting moments, we see it in ourselves. Months after this trip, Rickett had healed and I was ice skating at my neighborhood park, only a few blocks away from where my grandma was raised. A woman there recognized my white earth sweatshirt and said, Boujou. I asked what her family name is. She was a Fairbanks. We laughed about the possibility of being family, talked about going up north, being in the city, and how a family leaving a place is okay as long as they remember where they're from. A thread remains, some may call it a spirit, waiting for someone to listen. Thanks to the Ojibwe People's Dictionary for providing the Ojibwe chapter titles. You can look up Ojibwe words and pronunciation at the Ojibwe People's Dictionary website. Thanks to my grandma, Maggie Rousseau, Merlin Deegan, Joe Allen, Father Joe, and the whole White Earth community. I've included links to each of the respective organizations in the show notes. In the introduction of this piece, I wanted to be clear that you were hearing both Ojibwe and English played in reverse. Thanks to Alex, my creative partner, who also picked me up at the end of the ride and helped me create the music for the show. Finally, thanks to my family, past, present, and future, for keeping the threads together. <laughs>